Welcome to the Cross Border Interviews. I'm your host, Chris Brown, and we are continuing our year long series on local elected leaders from across this great country. Today, we are heading to my home province of Alberta, Canada, to speak to the town of Drumheller's mayor. She is a two term mayor, as she was first elected in 2017 and then re elected in 2021. Please help me welcome Mayor Heather Kohlberg. Mayor, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. So, I'm Heather. I am as well. Before, let's get the first question that I've asked every single person on this show. You're no exception. Where did your sense of duty to serve come from, Heather? You know, it's kind of an ironic story. Um, our family had a transportation company in town called Highway 9 Express, which uh, the community was very, very loyal to us. And um, our, my oldest brother, actually, I have three brothers. My oldest brother passed away, but he had said at one point one of us had to give back to uh, to municipal politics and unfortunately he passed away the year before the election so my other two brothers lived out of the valley and my parents were aging at the time unfortunately they've passed now but so i kind of drew the short card at the time and and was the one to step up and fulfill and ironically you know it's been the i i always say i have the best job in the valley i absolutely love uh, love the work i love the role and so, yes, I've been blessed and been able to be the mayor for the two terms now. So, so it yeah. sounds like the, your your dinner table was full of political talk growing up and uh, talking about community and giving back. Was politics discussed a lot growing up or did it come later on in life, the sort of the draw to give back through that municipal realm as you talked about your late brother having that conversation? You know, we really never did talk about politics uh, at home. It was just, we were really just focused on business. And we had, at the time, um, we had 500 plus employees. So you had so many people's lives in your hands. So you just really focused on the work and focused on running an operation that was so efficient. And so when politics never really came um, other than, especially my oldest brother and I continually got asked to to run for council or run for at that time, aldermen, councillors. So it was just something that we always kind of knew was there, but wasn't. We, we, our parents always taught us to give back. Like, you know, even when we didn't have a lot of money, it was about time and energy and supporting causes. So we always learned that you had to give back. Um, in fact, I have a saying that giving back in any form will change your life. And I absolutely believe that. And and this is kind of one another one of those things of giving back. It's giving back to community that was so good to us. So I just, yeah, I really feel that our family just kind of directed us not in a political way, but in just a. So what yeah. happened in 2016 and 2017? Because you say you you were having that conversation and the untimely passing of your brother, but what was the issue? Because there's always something that says, okay, now is the time. Maybe it could have happened four years prior, could have happened four years later, but you chose in 2017, this was the time that you were going to put your name on the ballot. Was it just the encouragement and with the passing of your brother, or was there other issues as well locally happening in the community that you said, I need to get involved because I believe I'm the best voice for it? It was really came down to the timing for me. It was a good time in my life. I my kids were were already gone. They're adults. Uh, we had we had sold our business. I had got into decorating and uh, a few things like that, and I was enjoying kind of life. And then I had a lot of people that within the valley kept encouraging me. You can do this. You should do this. You you know help us and. And I think it was just, I started to pay attention to, and I have no, like I have all respect for previous councils and the work they've done because this isn't a job for the faint at heart. So I would never be the one to sit here and ever condemn what the work was done. I just think I was at a time that I was able to give. I was really able to give of myself and I had the time to do it and I and I have the energy to do it. And, and I think, you know, kn knowing the people that came that were really supporting me to do this. They've been there along the way as well, helping. So I, I, I think for me, it was just the time. In fact, I got asked when I'm the first um, female mayor in Drumheller. And the first question I got asked when I got elected is, what's it like to be the first female mayor? And I said, it's not about that the fact I'm a female, it's the fact I was ready. And the people 
at the time felt I was ready. So I think it just was a combination of things. So I want to go back. I want to go back to that very first election for a few minutes here for a second. And I want to ask this question because it sounds like you have a pulse of your community uh, as a business owner, as someone who has a long history in your community. When you were out door knocking, though, were there issues that were coming up that you didn't expect to hear, whether it be local micro issues or more macro issues about provincial issues or federal issues? affecting your community or were the issues that you were hearing at the door and you're from your neighbors, the issues you expected to hear? I think the issues were what I expected to hear. We had a lot of houses on the market at the time. So people were having trouble moving theirs. We had a, a, a downtown that was, was not very vibrant. Uh, we had a lot of empty, empty buildings so I was hearing more local issues. I didn't hear as much provincial and federal issues. And and our community vision is to be the cleanest, friendliest, most sought after community in Alberta. And that was a, a, a was vision that our previous council, we came up with because we wanted to be that. We wanted, so we have put a lot of effort into cleaning up our community and making it where people, you know, you come down the valley and you see planters and trees and, and so I think that was a lot of what I heard is just, you know, wanting to get the the community more vibrant. And so we did put a lot of effort in that in the first term and accomplished a lot. For those who are the- for those who are watching this, not who are listening to this, not watching this, I'm ninety percent sure over the top of uh, the mayor's uh, shoulder is that motto that she just said. So I'm not sure if that's your office and you always have that in the back of your mind just to always yep. remember what you're doing. It's there. There yeah. you go. Oh, yeah, it's there. It's there every day when I walk in. And um, it's just a, I think it's people, people are attracted to um, healthy, clean environments. And we do, we do a lot. I, um, we have a, well, we have it was a 21 day challenge. So we ask every, or 20, 20, we did 20, 20 challenge. So we ask people starting April 1st, for 20 days, 20 minutes a day to help us clean up the valley. And so uh, they go around and, and everybody helps. And our valley is immaculately clean because of that. And then people get in the habit. And I say, we have all these little um, litter warriors up there that are constantly picking up um, to keep our valley clean. So it's taken a lot of just having the community have pride and, and ownership in the valley. Is your community engaged? It sounds like it from that just statement, but I'm assuming there's a lot of mayors out there or councillors out there who would love to hear what you just said happened in their community. What brings you to the idea that your community, the the town of Drumheller, is engaged in a way that they want to show that pride of community, whether it be that 2020 mentality in April? I think it starts from... Well, it has to start from us, right? It has to start from the start from the, our council or myself, administration. And I think it's those one of those things when people see that we're willing to take the step forward and have the pride, it just I don't know, it just kind of leads. Like it's it's pretty incredible to actually watch, you know, you can be watching someone walk down the street and they'll see something on the sidewalk and they'll pick it up and they'll throw it in the garbage. Like I don't know. It's, it's it's a small concept, but it's it. And I do by habit. Like now, I, I've always done it by habit. But it's kind of ironic when I bring, you know, we have people coming to town, whether it's somebody looking at building or whatever. And I, and I do that. They all kind of step back because, you know, they they're not used to it, I guess. But here, it's become very norm. While we're going to be talking about tra- uh, tourism a little bit later, I want to jump in in this with that statement and say. Drumheller is a very tourist destination for a lot of people across Canada and even around the world. Right. Does that does that mentality of, you know what, I'm going to pick up that litter and put it in the garbage, does that rub off on some of the tourists you find? Or are you trying to educate tourists, tourists as well to say, let's try and keep it beautiful for the next tourists who are coming through the town? Well, we really do hope that we are bleeding it into them because 
it, it does get frustrating for some of our locals because the after a long weekend or something, they'll, you know, it's, oh my goodness, like, why can't people just throw it in the garbage, you know, or throw a pack of cigarettes out the window? Like, I mean, go put it in the garbage when you buy your next pack. Or, so I think it's, it's a constant education. I honestly, I do believe, and it's having that, that respect of, you got to respect a person's community. You can't go into it's not you won't wouldn't go in their house and walk across their house with dirty boots. So don't walk into our community and throw your garbage. So yeah, we're we're pretty adamant about keeping our valley clean. Well, I I appreciate it. And every time I've been there, it's always been one of the cleanest communities that I've always seen. So you you must be doing something right. Um, oh, I want to. I want to go back to 2017 for a second here, and I want to ask the question that I've asked a lot of politicians, because you always remember the first time you get to go into a voting booth and vote for yourself. You always remember that first time you see your name and you put that X beside it, knowing at least you've got one vote, even though it is a secret ballot, you expect your family is going to vote for you. What was that moment like for you? Because all the work that you've done through that campaign, all the work that you've done prior, it all comes down to what people do in that box. For you, though, as the name on the ballot, what was that experience like voting for yourself? It was a, it was actually a quite a ironic feeling. I don't know <laughs> if you ever would have, you'd have that once in your life if you're around. Because if you know, in the next term, it didn't feel the same. I think it was just a overwhelming, uh, nervous feeling that you're there and and you're actually in the game. And you know, where are you going to come out in the game? You don't know. You know, you've. I know I personally, like I, I door knocked two thousand one hundred twenty nine doors personally. I didn't ask for help because I wanted. To, if I was going to make it, I was going to make it because I, I did the work, and I. I think that's why I, when I put that X, I'm like, I know I didn't, I left everything on the, on the table. I didn't, I couldn't have looked back and said, I wish I should have, I could have. Why didn't I, I don't, I didn't have any of those. So I, I felt, you know, I knew I did my work and, and I had to leave it up to the community, but it is a pretty cool feeling to, to uh, do that. And then actually win the election. So you you end up winning the first time out. You're one of the very few lucky people who have ever had the chance to win an election, but also serve on council. Um, I want to talk about I've that. Never, very... I never served on well, council. Well, you before. serve on council as in the fact that you won and then you get to serve on council. I should say that. Yeah, yeah. So that moment you win, you go from being the candidate to the mayor elect. You walk into that council chambers for the very first time as mayor elect. How much of a responsibility do you put on yourself to make sure that what you do, what you de- what your decisions you make in that council chambers are going to help move the community forward, but not do it in a way that it's going to leave people behind? Is there a weight and responsibility that you put on yourself in that moment or and do you still have it to this day? I think you always have that responsibility. But this is something I wish would happen with uh, many elected. Okay, so before I decided to run, I went and visited eight mayors throughout Alberta, and I I was very fortunate. They all gave me their time. I asked questions. Um, you know, what what would they do? What would they do different? I I even give them a bit of my history, and I said, you know, look at. Do you think I'm even fit for the role? Because I I don't want to fail um, for the community. I don't want to be the wrong person and so I think and then besides I watched mm, I don't know how many hundred meetings to you know because there's a lot of procedures and processes and yeah you have to be and I think this is where sometimes politics gets hard is because people just don't don't realize once you go into it the the responsibility you have you were and they're hard decisions. Don't don't get me wrong. I'm not, you know, I've made every decision is tough because you know that you've got somebody's life that you're either going to enhance or it's, you know, and so they're they're very tough decisions. And I I would encourage anybody going into politics, do your homework because it's not for the faint of heart. 
what were some of the questions you asked those former mayors or the current mayors that I'm not sure what eight mayors you spoke uh, you spoke to, but what were some of the questions that if someone was thinking about running today and they're thinking, okay, in 2024 in Alberta, when the next election happens, I'm going to run. What are the questions that should be asked to a potential uh, current mayor or past mayor to say, am I the right person? I think, well, first off, you got to understand how much, what the commitment is. Um, and with any role, is it, what, no matter what you do, it's how much effort you're going to put in is what you're going to reward. But I, I was told originally, um, you know, 10 to 15 hours a week. Well, I, you know, that, that was, but those who told you 10 like, to 15 hours a week? I, I wanted. <laughs> That's what I was told before I even thought of running. But when I visited with these mayors, they're the ones that said, you know what, you you got to be prepared to be uh, available because your community expects you available pretty much 24 seven. You know, not that it's whether that's right or wrong, they do. And so that was awesome to really understand the role. And, uh, you know, you are you're you're not the one you. Uh, how do I put that? Everybody thinks you can make all the decisions, but you you're not. I you mean, you have first you have six counselors, but you have an administration, and your job is policy procedures. So th those are things that people need to learn too. They they think that I can phone the the guy at Public Works and say fix the pothole. That's not my role, you know. Although sometimes we get too far down, and I am guilty of that. But um, my CAO will tell you that. But I, at the end of the day, surprisingly, a lot of people are being honest and saying that exact same thing, though. A lot of people, when they first get elected, they try to do that in depth uh, work with the public works manager, the community service manager. But then you have to remember your only employee is the CAO. <laughs> that's right. And that's where that was huge again. I really understanding the whole tier of how things are. And, and I was really that was a great education from those eight mayors as well. They were really, really good at explaining strategic planning, priority lists. And I had a lot of that. I mean, we had 500 employees, so it wasn't like this wasn't um, new to me, but I was never in government. I, I didn't even, I was never a counselor. So I went strictly from the public or from the private sector right into a mayor. So it was, you know, I had a transition different than, you know, most go through counselor first and then. So um, that was I. That was the best education I had. Like um, the just every mayor, like the mayor of Camrose, the mayor of Canmore, Bam Brooks, like they were just all incredible. Sitting down with me and just and after I walked out, I just I the last question I said is, "Do you think I'm ready for this?" And I I got a eight out of eight. So I was oh. happy about that. Um, I want to turn to one thing before we turn to the, the town of Drumheller. And you talked about that balance of personal life and work life. As a municipal politician, you are the front line of politics that people interact with on a day-to-day -day basis. You don't work in Edmonton and come home on weekends. You don't work in Ottawa and then come home on uh, every three weeks. You go to the grocery store. You're the mayor. You're Mayor Colberg wherever you go in your community. After five years, have you been able to find a balance of work and personal life? Because I can imagine you don't want to be Mayor Colberg every single time you go out or sit down at a restaurant in your community you want to just be Heather from time to time. Have you found that balance? In a small, in a, in a smaller community, I don't know if you ever hundred percent find that balance because even friends who I've grown up with, well, instead of saying, Hey, Heather, how are you? Say, Hey, Mayor, how's life? And I'm like, hi, I'm Heather. <laughs> you know? So I don't know if you ever really find that particular balance in a small community, you know, especially if you're out and active and, and involved. But I think it's, I'm very fortunate. I've got an amazing husband, uh, amazing family, and they keep me grounded. Like they're the ones that remind me that, um, you know, look, at we got to go out, go to the movie tonight. And then they take me in and sit me down, and like just, just relax. But I think having the support of your family is huge. Like it's, it's everything. 
for me anyways. And I've got great friends that just check in on me and say, hey, let's go for a walk or let's, you know, just get me out. Um, you know, go we'll go walk on the trails. So it's kind of you're out in the middle of nowhere and, and stuff. So I, I, I'm very fortunate that way. Got a good supporting cast and you need them. So I want to turn to segment two now, and this is about the town in general. And before I start this segment, I want to preface this question by saying this. For those who are listening, this is a conversation between the mayor and myself. This is not a direction of council. This is not a motion at council. This is not a policy of council. This is her opinion. We seem to get a lot of emails about this question. Uh, (laughs) Heather, in your opinion, what is the biggest issue facing the town of Drumheller today? I would say our biggest issue right now is housing. We went from over 200 plus houses on the market to, I don't know, I think we're less than 30 or something like that. The number's very low. We have zero rental um, market right now. Our our, our, actual, our percentage is zero. Wow. Um, so our housing strategy is is probably everything. And we've just done a lot of work on demolishing an old hospital, an old school, an old bar to make space for for development. So I think our biggest thing is, um, you know, and if anybody's listening, we need uh, developers in the valley here, you know, condo buildings, row housings, townhouses, because we're just, we have a real shortage of housing. And it's, in this industry, when when you know we have the penitentiary, they, they have no, you know, they're they're moving to Airdrie or Strathmore for housing. We don't. Our our whole industry is about tourism, so the people in the valley um, that are are needing seasonal work, there's nowhere to rent. So we we have a we have a housing crisis. So how do so you I'm, fix that there's... though? Because you're not the first mayor or councillor to say housing is an issue. It is an issue across this country right now. And there are developers right now who are, would love to go out and uh, build houses and build communities, but the cost of living and cost of doing business has gone through the roof. So in the short term and long term, how does the drum, uh, town of Drumheller overcome these obstacles until developers come into the town and start putting shovels to the ground well we're we're doing so we prepped land which is so it's ready to go they don't have to come in and do any demo or anything the land is ready uh we're we've created uh, quite a few housing incentives to have people come and and then we're we're what we're going to do we've done with two of our properties is we've done kind of drawings of what we visually see them to look like and we're putting a package together, and honest to goodness, there's we have a commercial realtor and a residential realtor that um, are involved with the town, and our FDEV uh, manager and myself, and we're just going to hit the ground and just go ask, like literally just see what we got to do to get them to here because we need like we my and that's my personal opinion, so I'm speaking, you know, but. And, and I have great support from council that if we built a condo complex that we could, that could be less entry level, let's not say the affordable word, cause that can get muddy, but, you know, entry level where, you know, young people, millennials can, can buy a condo for a couple hundred thousand dollars and we can have some rental property. And then all of a sudden we've opened up spaces. And then if we develop a 55 plus, area where we have you know three-story condo row housing town housing cottages so that you know there's a lot of people that are in their 60 plus that want to downsize so all of a sudden we move them into a space and now we opened up 100 homes so we've i think in, you know I'm, I'm a very optimist i'm very positive look i look at life with the glass half full versus half empty and i honestly believe if we you know really work with a developer and see what they need, like whatever they need. Let's figure out how to make it work. And I, I'm really positive that we could find somebody that will come and help us. You got to make it profitable for them, right? It's nobody wants to work for nothing. So there's got to be some way to make it work. I'm going to ask the question that a lot of people, a lot of councils are dealing with right now. 
And I want to know from you, is your community looking at growth in a sustainable way? Because a lot of communities are facing aging infrastructure issues right now, and they can't grow too fast, too quickly. While you're saying we need it, is the infrastructure there to sustain the potential growth? And then once you answer that, I have a question about nimbyism I want to ask you about, because I can imagine there's people in your community who say, whoa, 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 growth, do not want growth, do not want it to come here. I like my small town feel. I want to keep it that way. How do you battle back against that as well? Um, so I believe we have the infrastructure. Uh, we've got things in place. We're doing a ton of work right now on uh, flood mitigation, which, you know, flood mitigation is a very controversial topic because if you're going to put, you know, a berm between your house and the river and you're taking away people's land or space, it's, it's controversial. So we have a $55 million flood mitigation program on the go as we speak. So that is helping us. I know it's difficult, but at the same time, it's helping make our community safer. So therefore, that's a, a big thing in having the whole safety and, and and the infrastructure. Yes, it's ongoing. I don't care what community you're in. You are constantly, if you're not putting money into infrastructure every year, eventually things are going to blow up. And we're, you know, every, we just had a big water problem here with a pipe and it's one of our main things. So those are continual. But I do believe that um, we we made a super deal with CN uh, to take over the trail throughout the whole middle of town. So we're going to have a beautiful trail that crosses the bridge. And so we've done a lot, like we've done a lot to make Drumheller a place you want to live. And now, especially, you know, and I don't use that word, but with the whole thing we just went through, people are working from home and people are, so they want that, that lifestyle that they you know, don't have these big homes to look after. They can get out of their condo. And this is where I want this condo built is attached, like right beside the trail. Get on the trail, go bike, um, stop downtown. We've got like lots of little cafes now and sandwich shops. And so I think it's a lot about the whole, the vibe. It's about making our valley. And that's why, you know, we're not Calgary or Red Deer or Edmonton that just, going to put up you know 200 condo units where you know we're a small community but one condo unit is a game changer for us do you have to build and up so instead now, of out because a lot of communities are facing that growth is you only have a certain amount of space in your community you can only go out to the outskirts of your town before you start building into someone else's county or md does, does the the town of Drumheller have to start building up and potentially looking at apartment buildings, or is that even out of the question right now? Well, no, that's that's not a, a bad thing to think about because we are a valley and you only have so much space. You got to use it wise. And I think that's where having, we don't have one nice condo complex for millennials. We just don't, or not even just millennials, but you know, for for people who want small living, we don't have that. So um, I, I would say we, if we had that, we could, we still have a lot of houses because then people would move into to that. And especially that seniors, that seniors community. Oh my goodness, that that's just a dream of mine. What's the average age of Drumheller today? I'm going to need it. <laughs> what's the average age of drum heller if you if you know that off the top of your head is it a more um, of a, a family oriented town or is it more is it a is, is there an aging population in drum heller it's an aging population yeah it's okay. aging so i wanted i want to ask this now because you you've given your top issue you believe that is facing the town of drum heller but if i go to the town tomorrow and i go ask 100 people in your community that exact same question they're going to give me 100 different issues they may have local issues whether they want that park upgraded or that sidewalk fixed or that pothole fixed or they might talk about what you said we need more housing we need more uh, uh buildings so that way people can live here and bring in more tax dollars how do you take what your community is facing 
and you and council, I say you and the royal you, and dissect what needs to happen to move this town forward. Because those 100 people that I talk to will all believe their issue is the most important issue in their community. How do you, at the end of the day, pick and choose what issues you have to move forward on and which ones have to be forgotten of this budget cycle and potentially end up in next year's budget cycle? Well, I can tell you that um, basically we have a priority list. <laughs> and this is like... A so mayor that comes do, prepared for a question. I love it. <laughs> well, I just happened to be working on it today because it's a list, you know, we listen to the people of, okay, what are their budget concerns? What are their housing concerns? What are their parks and recreation concerns? And as council, we literally, we all listen to different people. We write down what we're hearing, and then we build this into a program for administration. And so that, you know, down to the little things like, you know, making sure that our our entries are, are always groomed, making sure that in our parks are always maintained. So a lot of this stuff we build in, we call it a priority list. A lot of a lot of councils call it strategic. I strategic to me just is a word that just gets talked about, but not done. Priority list gets its focus. So yeah, right down to, you know, our, you know, our every part of it, whether it's the trails, whether it's the parks, whether it's the mill rate, like all of that stuff goes into it and we divide it between the different departments and then we request them to finish this within the year. Did the, so, did yeah. the, does the average resident care about that though? Because their issue is the most important issue to them. They don't care about a priority list. They don't care about a strategic list. They they want that pothole or that park fixed because that's well, where their then, kid then plays. There's this, then there's this book <laughs> where I write everything down and then I follow it till it's done. So yeah, we do listen. We listen to everything. So I yeah, mean, and besides... We implemented a really cool app called C Click Fix, like C Click and then Fix. I know it and quite it, well. <laughs> okay, and it's it's the most incredible app because if somebody sees the pothole, you know, not guaranteeing it's going to get fixed tomorrow, but at least it's in the system. You know, like right now, they're not going to fix potholes because the ground's still um, settling from all the frost and. It's, still a couple months out but at least it's on the list so when the time comes they do it and that app alone has changed a lot for our community because now our residents it's in there they're advised when it's going to be fixed um and then they're not having to call a counselor all the time to get so it just makes everything more efficient it creates a really good work plan for for public works in fact when we first implemented i don't think public works really liked it because it felt like but, you know, now they see it's a good thing because now they know what needs to be done versus someone getting on the phone, getting mad at them or, you know. So, yeah, it's it really works well. We are in a very tough time economically right now for a lot of municipalities. Um, people are struggling and it's coming at the backs of the municipalities because you don't want to be seen as raising the tax rate too much. But you also understand that the cost of business does go up. Was this budget cycle a tough budget cycle for the town of Drumheller? And if so, how do you continue to move the city, uh, the town forward while not putting it on the backs of the residents who are there in a fashion that you still know that people will want the services that they come to expect? Yeah, I think every municipality this year was up against a really tough budget. Uh, we were able to hold our well. We had a we had about a four percent tax increase for the RCMP, and um, did that affect you guys a lot? Oh yeah, it it definitely had a huge impact. And and then you know we we cut besides you know we had what you know we all have the the unions and stuff that we have to deal with, and that was coming up with us this year as well. So there was a lot happening. Um, you know, we did have to make some tough decisions and and change some things and and reduce a few things, but we still ended up with a four point, I believe it was four point one or four point two increase. But it was really the cost of just that that funneling into hate. Trust me, I'm I'm a number one fan of their CMP and and 
police and everything. So it wasn't a case that we were, you know, we knew it had to be done. And I think the people understood too. It wasn't, if we would have, if we'd have done that plus had another, you know, two or 3%, that would have been really difficult, but we did some really good creative um, adjustments and, an administration did an amazing job of finding some savings. And yeah, we I, I'm just forward. laughing at the fact that you said creative adjustments. I've never heard it called that before. So that was a <laughs> unique word from the mayor. <laughs> well, we, we still want to move our valley forward, but we got to figure out how to make the most of every dollar. So they have to be where I'm a, I, I love the out of the box thinking. And that's what they did. A lot of ways to make sure we're still advancing the community, but we weren't. Because you can't really just stop. I mean, infrastructure doesn't stop. You know, water services don't. Like, things don't stop. So you have to keep, you know, How keep much out-of-the-box thinking have you had to do since being elected? Because I can imagine you get elected in 2017, and then that thing we're not mentioning because we don't want to say the word because it's not going to happen anymore, um, happens. And then your community, which thrives on tourism and i say that with respect because i think it is a tourist destination for a lot of people mm -hmm. gets hammered and then we're out of it now and you're slowly seeing the people come back how much out of the box thinking have you have you and your council had to do over the last five years well i'm telling you somebody had told me i went up <laughs> against that plus a flood mitigation program plus lose both my parents i might have said oh i'm not sure about this job but um, you know, it was, it was, it was one of those things that I don't think anybody, well, you couldn't have prepared. I wish I could have went back to the mayor of 1930, whatever, and said, Hey, how did you handle, um, that you other know, thing. Pandemic down there? Yeah. But, um, it, it, it just really, you had to, you had to roll with the decisions. I mean, nobody could prepare you. Nobody said, and you had this vision that there was going to be something climbing over the hills. And, and you know, when you're told that, um, you know, you could lose so many of your seniors and it was it was not for the faint of heart on any elected level, like whether provincial, federally, it was a very um, and it's and we're suffering for it. I mean, supply chain suffering so much is. Uh, so many people passed without having loved ones with them. It was a terrible, terrible yeah. thing to go through. And I, I pray that no ever person that ever sits in my chair again and other any counselors have to go through that. And, uh, and but we, you know, we got through it, and we, and at the same time, we were going through this nasty flood mitigation program. So it was, you know, we had a lot um, going on. And but I, I commend the people. Um, the past council and this council, they've they've stayed strong. They've stayed true. And I I tell them like you got to make decisions that you're not you're not going to be loved for. But if you know if your gut's telling you that you're making the right decision, you go with it. If it's telling you you're making the wrong one, you better find out the answers. And those are they they were tough ones. I tell you, not ones I want to go through again. I could imagine. Um, I want to turn to our last segment because I'm cautious of time here and I know you are a busy mayor. Um, I want to talk about my favorite subject because I'm a tourist. I love touring. I love visiting communities. And I want to talk about tourism for you. Uh, so we know that Drumheller is a tourist destination for a lot of people. But I'm going to spin my question that I usually ask mayors. What are the hidden gems that most people who come to Drumheller don't often go to that you want to promote right now? Because we all know the museum. We all know the big Tyrannosaurus. We all know the dinosaurs downtown. But what are the hidden gems that people should be looking out for? Well, the Atlas coal mine is one that not a lot of people see because it's a little bit oh, it's 20 kilometers down the road amazing if you're interested in coal mining we just had this one is brand new so very few people know about it but it's barney's adventure park an incredible place that uh you can take whether you're an adult a uh, uh, child you know it's definitely you can get your kids out there they can run there's a dinosaur trail that you can actually hear dinosaurs roar in there but then they have a petting zoo and yet you know, then they have entertainment for adults. 
incredible spot there. The Blariot Ferry. I don't know if ever you know if everybody's ever thought of crossing a ferry. Like literally an old fashioned, you drive your car on and you cross the ferry. Okay, uh, I, I'm going to say this. I've lived in Alberta since 2013. I did not think that if I was ever to be speaking to the mayor of Drumheller, they'd be talking about a ferry, which is in the yeah. badlands of Alberta. But here we are. Really? Yeah, it's it's just a really unique, and you can go through a whole horse thief canyon and everything. Uh, it's a just a, a lot of people bike it, if you're really fit, I guess. But it's an incredible drive around uh, the dinosaur trail around the valley. So that's something that, and and now we've got, now we're working on this incredible trail throughout the, so people don't know about our new, uh, we call it rails to trails. And it's, it's an incredible ride you can make throughout our valley now. And, you know, on an e-bike, normal bike, scooter, it's, yeah, there, there's that's just a new thing too. So yeah, those are there's a few things for you. I'm just trying to think. There's so much of ours, like the hoodoos everybody knows about. Obviously, the museums. There's a really cool East Cooley Museum, school museum, an actual old school that's really really unique. Anyone so who says museums, I'm always perking my eyes up because I'm always out for a good museum day. So I'm looking forward yeah, to. So we uh, <laughs> and then we have the Homestead Museum. Like we actually have quite a few museums here that people only think of the Royal Tyrrell Museum, but the Homestead Museum is all agriculture and and old old tractors and so there's some pretty cool things. But people tend to go to those two or three hot spots. But all of those other ones I mentioned are absolutely incredible. Well, as I've told yeah. every mayor and counselor who's come on the show, I'm coming out to your community again, and we're going to be doing some live uh, videotaping of the community. So I'm looking forward to seeing some of those other hot spots. But all right, second last question for you here, uh, Heather. What about yourself, though? After a stressful day at council, after a stressful day at work, where do you go into the community to decompress? And I can say this, and I'm going to say this to you because I've said it to everyone else. You can't say your own home because a lot of mayors and counselors <laughs> just like to go away to their own home. So where do you like to go to decompress in the community? Well, to me, decompressing is being with family and friends. So I'm, again, very fortunate. I've got, I like to just, just really go for walks because we have this beautiful, incredible thing. And actually this year I got those, those boots with the spikes so that I don't crash because I'm terrible. I'm quite clumsy. Um, I've never th thought about that. Is there a park that you go to or a restaurant or a favorite watering oh, we hole? So many. Like we have the Valley Brewery. We have a, a an amazing brewery if you're into craft. Like to, it's, they are, so I love to go there on their deck. Um, we, we have so many good restaurants. Um, it's just... I'm a big, I'm a big picnic person. Like I love picnics, even if it's go to stop the grocery store and get some stuff. And my husband drives me around and we check out all the things in town. So I do that's probably, probably one of my most depressing because I'm always looking for what we need to fix next. So, so we um, have a picnic, we have a little two and a half pound puppy and we tour the Valley. That sounds adorable. <laughs> Uh, my last question for you here, Heather, and it, you can take as long as you want to answer this, and it's a very loaded question, but what makes the town of Drumheller such a unique place to live, to work, and to raise a family? Well, we're unique because we are the dinosaur capital of the world, and that's not something anybody else can, can use because we've trademarked it. Um. To live is it's quality of life. I'm my I have two boys that live in the city, and in fact, we were just there a few days ago. And and they we get home in the valley here. It's it's a calmer lifestyle. Yes, we don't have we can't go to a ballet or we can't you know do this and that. But we're close enough to the city that you can you can you can live here. But if you want to go do those things, you're close enough. You're only an hour and a half away. But it, I think it's a quality of life. And I know that that's an overused saying, but it truly is. I mean, we have we have the river in the summer. It's a, 
it's an amazing thing to canoe if you ever have you can do tours where you can actually go and spend overnight camping but you know just to rent a canoe for a weekend i'm a big my girlfriends and we love to float like we actually have floaties and we float down the river and we have our little pops in our in our things and there's just things like that and now with the whole trail system that we're incorporating and and the fact that we have a trail society who's working to get even more trails into the hills i think it's just really a, a unique place you can go to work be home in five minutes just about from anywhere in the valley and you know yes we're working harder on trying to find more industry and average to above average income because in you know tourism isn't the most highest paid um jobs so our ecdev is always looking for a manufacturer something that can come here and give that average to above average so that would probably be you know something i'd really love to see and then the whole live work play is that the last one you had play is raise is, a family raise a family so you know that we do have you know the fountain the spray park we have uh lots of other parks around the community and and that, any community everything needs to more work we could add more we need to enhance this and and that's what we constantly look for is how do you make it a community where you just you know that you want to make we're only here for x amount of time you know we're only put on this earth how do we make it where you 95% of the time you can say, I love my life. I love where I live. I love my work. You know, that's, if that's try and, and as community and as a municipality and as a council, that's what we look for always is how do we keep making life better for our people? And yes, you know, there's, you could go down the street today and probably somebody wouldn't like me because I know we got the flood program and we're probably building the berm in front of their house, but that's part of, our role is to just make the community as a, as a whole a better place. We can't always fix the little specifics, but we try to make it as a whole. And so, yeah, I, I'm I'm proud. I I had an amazing council my first term. Lots of really really great people that worked hard, and and you know we had three that for for personal reasons didn't run again. And and I was fortunate the next council were have a strong council again, and they're very. They fight for their people. And that's what it's all about is doing the right thing for the people. That's why you do this role. If you're doing it for any other reason, you're doing it for the wrong reasons. So, so yeah, I love my job. I got the best job in the Valley. <laughs> yeah. um, okay. I, I know I said that was my last question, but I have to ask because you kept on saying the Valley. Is it the town of Drumheller Valley or is it the town of Drumheller? Which one is it? Correct well, me here. We actually would love to change the name just to Drumheller Valley. Okay. Because rather than the town of Drumheller, because it really is a valley and in the middle of valley is all. So we want to include all the valley in our discussion. So that's why we say the valley because we're, um, what are we, 40 kilometers long or something? So we're along. And so we want all parts of the valley to feel like they're part of the drum helen. So well, that's why I refer to the valley. Well, I yeah. want to thank the mayor of Drumheller Valley, Heather Kohlberg, for coming on the show today. It's been an honor and pleasure to sit down with you. The uh, Drumheller Valley is very lucky to have you at the head of the council table, and I look forward to seeing what your community has in store for it for the years to come. So thank you so much for sitting down with me today. Well, thank you so much for asking. And please be sure when you come, I will take you to a few of those hot spots. I'll take you to our Valley Brewing and uh, you can check out their product. And yeah, no, I'm really, really appreciate you the time. This is, I, I, I just love our Valley. I love everything about it. So I can never, I could talk for hours about it. <laughs> so with that, I want to remind everyone, put down social media for at least five to 10 minutes a day and go have a conversation with somebody. It helps our society, helps our democracy, and helps us be a better people at the end of the day. So with that, this has been the Cross Border Interviews with Chris Brown. Have yourself an excellent day. And remember, everyone, keep talking.